Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours in Cabo San Lucas. This is the online webcast where I answer your data platform questions. If you've got database questions, you can post them over at the URL in the description of the video, brentozartpolgab.com slash room slash brento. Um, I am in Cabo San Lucas on the beach this morning. It is baby turtle season. I'm uh, going to be heading down. Uh, walk in the beach. Looks like I probably already missed it. There are a bunch of people already. I got a late start this morning. Don't judge me. It's my first weekend down here. So, or my first day down here. So, since I got up late, I figured, why don't I just answer your questions instead? So, the top voted question comes from Kirk Saunders, who asks, Hey Brent, when did you determine that your knowledge, skill set, etc., was sufficient enough to teach your various classes. I, you're assuming that I did. <laughs> he says, I think I'm doing well at my job, but I'm concerned that I'm overestimating my skill set because I'm a big fish in a small pond. Any insight on a more objective measure is greatly appreciated. Okay, so there, there are a couple parts to building a training class. And, and don't think about a whole entire class. Think about just a one hour session first, like a user group session. The first thing about building that session is talk about, here's what worked for me. You don't have to give the biblical all-ending answer uh, to exactly how everything should be done on a particular task or topic. Just talk about what worked for you. Don't talk about theory. Don't try to go tackle a feature you've never used when you're just getting started by far the most effective thing is to talk about what worked for you. Uh, then the second challenge with building a session is you're going to have questions. The audience is going to have questions, some of which you won't know the answer to. Be completely comfortable saying, I don't know, but here's where I would go look for that answer. Because you've done the topic, whatever it is that you're talking about, you've built up a list of resources, people in the industry uh, who have repeatedly showed up in your Google searches, websites, whatever, uh, that you would go, here's where I would go for more help on that particular topic. So those are the two big things. Talk about what worked for you, uh, and then you're going to get questions that you don't know the answer to. I still do all the time. Just say, I don't know, and move on. And, and, but here's where I would go look to find out. Next up, we have Monkey who asks, Howdy Brent, when I specify retain days or expire date when I'm doing my backups and I set them to 30 days, does that mean that after 30 days some job checks whether my backup expires and deletes it? No. If no, <laughs> good how he followed up there, how can I make it so that files older than 30 days are deleted automatically? That's up to you to do. If you use maintenance jobs, there's a cleanup task that you can use in your maintenance plans. If you use Ola Hollingren's backup scripts, he has a job or a parameters in the job that will delete files older than a certain number of days. There's a little bitty, couple little bitty birds down here eating seeds. Next up, Yakov asks, what was office hours like prior to the introduction of PolGab? Oh, that's such a good question. So there were two things that sucked. Uh, one is that I couldn't do it asynchronously. Uh, the way that we handled questions was is we did a live webcast in like WebEx or go to uh, Zoom or whatever, go to meeting, uh, go to webinar. And we would do a live webcast and people would type their questions in the question area or chat and there was no way to figure out what were the good questions. So these questions would just come flying by, people would put the questions in the wrong place, they would put them in chat, whatever. Uh, now at least all the questions are organized in one nice place and I can do them asynchronously. So y'all put together the questions that you want and upload them, then I get to just sit down somewhere nice like on a beach in Mexico. So I love this so much more than real-time webcasts because I don't want to schedule myself to be in front of a computer at one specific day and time. That really cramps my style. <laughs> I don't like working. I don't know about you, but I don't like working. If I could avoid real-time work, I would really like to do that. That's probably a good piece of career advice. Anytime that you can figure out how to be paid asynchronously, like do the work at a date and time and place that works for you and then get paid for it separately, that's uh, much better. 
Next up, Rizzo asks, how should you deal with a SQL power user that forgets to commit their transaction on a busy server before leaving for the day? A lot of people, when they, when they hear a question like this, I know a lot of database administrators are going to go to the permissions angle. They're going to say that that user shouldn't have permissions. Here's the way that I think of it. It's no different than an application that has a bug. Applications have bugs. They're just always going to have bugs, and applications are going to have bugs where they don't close their transactions properly. What you have to do is expect that and believe that you need to set up monitoring for long-running transactions. Because regardless of whether it's a user or an application, the bigger problem is that we didn't know about it in time to react. Then, when it is time to react, if you have a transaction that's longer, I like really low thresholds. I like like five minutes. If something's working, has a transaction open for more than five minutes, I start to get really suspicious. Uh, but so if, if something's holding a transaction open longer than five minutes, or whatever number it is that you pick, then you have to make the decision ahead of time. What criteria am I going to use to decide whether or not to kill the query? Then make those decisions and roll from there. But don't don't just don't be like ah oh, never give them permissions again. Applications are gonna have that problem. What are you gonna say? You gotta close that application. No one's ever allowed to use that application again. It's just not gonna work. I think I learned that voice from my dad. I think that's where that. It's not that he used that voice on us. I mean that he would use that same voice when he was doing examples of things. I know you said when I was your age things were better. You know things like that. Gary says, hi Brent, we have a commercial application that creates a lot of temp tables, not in tempdb. So temporary tables inside a user database, he means, for ad hoc reporting and it doesn't clean up after itself. Is there a tipping point where too many tables in one database might cause overall performance problems with SQL Server? One of the things that I see a lot is that people ask tactical questions without having a strategy. Always come from the point of view of what's your server's top weight type and then what can you do to reduce that weight type. Stop picking random metrics. You know, I think fragmentation's a problem. Why? I think page splits are a problem. Why? I think too many tables are a problem. Why? You know, what is it that you go, people are complaining about this because if they're not complaining, Pick another battle. You got things that your users are complaining about, trust me. So when is it that too many tables, or what are the signs that too many tables are a problem? Backups. If your nightly backup jobs have too long of a window because you have too much data, then that's where you can start asking easy questions like, hey, I could reduce my backup window by cutting out all these temporary tables. I've, I've hit that same problem with an application that didn't clean up after itself. And what you can try is setting the default database for that application to tempdb. Now, this doesn't work with all you with all applications because sometimes they want to specifically say use a, this uh, one database, and then they're going to create the tables. But I've had an application that I worked with in the past where it just immediately would create table and it would dump contents into it, and it used fully qualified table names like Stack Overflow dot DBO dot users. So the source it didn't matter where we ran the queries from. They fully prefix the sources, so then that way I could just say create their default data or set their logins default database to tempdb. All their no real tables were created in tempdb, and they were just destroyed every time the server restarted. So who cares? Um, plus, the other thing that was nice about that is because they were destroyed on restart, their usually their application was down whenever the SQL Server restarted anyway. Like people had to go log back in. No worries about backups, etc. Yeah, but again, I can't say enough. That doesn't always work, but that might work for you. Ask your doctor if setting the database, the user's default database, to TempTB is right for you. I am not a doctor, but I'll take a look. Select star not ask or asterisk <laughs> asks, what's your thoughts about contained availability groups? For me, the new features contained master and MSDB is a big check mark for me. I don't think it's going to work. I know, am I a pessimist or what? I don't think it's going to work. I have a hunch 
that when most applications try to do what they would normally do, uh, putting things in a master MSDB, like if they call the stored procedures to add an agent job, uh, that those things will not work the way that they expect them to work. That's my guess. Um, things like backup history. I've worked with a database that checked your backup history uh, in order to see whether or not it, it had been backed up. I bet your backup history isn't successfully stored in each MSDB. Or if it is, it's only stored in the contained MSDB and it's not stored in the real MSDB. Meaning then monitoring applications that look for your most recent backups are going to blow chunks because the data is not there. I have I just hunches that there's going to be so many problems with that that it wasn't really thought through. Uh, and I think that the first year or two as people use that, it's going to be a whole lot of heartache and woe. Um, so there we go. That's my thought. Sticking to it. And I, I haven't touched it because it doesn't have a, a, a uh, doesn't solve a problem for me. The vast majority of applications that I work with, they want to do cross database queries. So in that case, a contained availability group doesn't work because you can have an, a contained AG fail over by itself over to another uh, replica, and that would break your cross database querying if you're trying to do inserts across multiple databases and so forth. Uncle Kenny G, <laughs> I like that says, we have a thousand databases on Azure SQL Server. Okay, what the hell is Azure SQL Server? That's not a thing. You might have Azure SQL DB, you might have Azure SQL DB managed instances, you might have hyperscale, you might have SQL Server running in an Azure VM, but there's no such thing as Azure SQL Server. I'm not even going to read the rest of that question because if you can make a mistake that badly in the beginning of the question, it makes no sense for me to continue reading. It's kind of like saying, I have a Chevrolet Mustang. No, you don't. If you're starting your question with that, you don't even know what car you're driving. We're done here. Next up, SQL Helper says, in the consulting world, how do you handle an engagement that you cannot solve? Oh, that's so good. Um, or is technically not possible as outlined in the statement of work? Do you get compensated for your time working on the issue? Okay, so because I've been doing this a really long time, let me tell you what works for me. I have a thing called the consultant toolkit. This is not a sales pitch. I'm just telling you how this thing works for me. I have a thing called a consultant toolkit that goes in and runs SP Blitz, SP Blitz First, SP Blitz Cache, Blitz Index, all kinds of things. All kinds of diagnostic data on their SQL Server, wraps it up into a nice zip file. So when a, cl a, c a prospective client books a sales call with me, I get that data. And so I look at what pain points they're describing and the data on their server, and I do a cursory look of, can I solve this problem? Then, during the sales call, I have a discussion of what does success look like for you? At the end of the engagement, you're going to say, thank God we hired Brent because he blank. What's that blank? So then, during that call, and when they say that, that's the, the first thing that I start with, I look at the data and I look at what their pain point is and I make a decision. Can I solve that pain point? in the time that we have the two-day SQL critical care or not. If the answer is yes, then I believe we can solve it, the client's risk is gone from that point forward. I assume all risk. If I can solve it, they paid. If I can't solve it, they don't pay a dime. Like I don't want them to uh, pay me and have, them not, have me not solve the problem. So as a result, I'm pretty confident when I see the server's metrics that I can solve the problem. I have absolutely walked in and been like, oh, as it turns out, I was wrong. You know, here's, here are the reasons why I can't solve the problem. I don't want to take your money. Because as a consultant, you, you don't want to have a whole lot of clients out there who paid you money and are pissed off. Uh, that's bad word of mouth advertising. I want good word of mouth advertising. Uh, oh, and for, okay, so the other thing is that that may not work for everybody, right? Some of you work on things like Power BI implementations or uh, migrations. In that case, what you want to do is, in the beginning, the first phase of the work is, I'm going to work with you for two days to build a statement of work and a project, or project plan, that's going to be the rest of the work. 
you would need to get paid for building that statement of work. And I'm, I've worked with clients and said, all right, look, you want me to uh, sketch out a, a migration for you to go to Amazon Web Services. You just move the databases because that's all I do. Um, you want me to sketch out a migration plan. Here's the thing, for the first two days, we're gonna look at the servers together and I'm gonna sketch out a plan. We're gonna figure out what the right product is for you up in Amazon. Is it Amazon RDS? Is it self-managed VMs? Are you doing HA with log shipping, with database mirroring, with uh, availability groups? What is it that we're gonna sketch out? We're gonna figure that out in the first two days and the output of those two days is gonna be a checklist of here are the big picture steps involved with this project how many days they're going to take, and what that would cost for me to do that work. Now, if at the end of the two days, we got a migration plan that's easy enough, I'll tell you, go. You paid me for those two days, I built you a plan, now go with God. You know, I think I've said God's name twice in this webcast. It's fairly unusual, and I'm not swearing. Uh, you know, go, vamanos, uh, uh, you know, hit the road, Jack. Uh, take it. I don't care whether you hire me or not for that. I got paid for those two days. Our work together here is done. I also don't care if you go take that project plan and you go to a whole bunch of other consultants and you say, what would it cost for you to implement this? Because I'm kind of like an emergency room surgeon for SQL Server. Uh, I am not the cheapest option on the block. Uh, so I would encourage you to find a less expensive consultant if you're doing something relatively straightforward like a log shipping implementation up in the cloud. Um, so I would do that same advice for you. If you think that the project is too big and there's too much risk involved, break it down into a first phase where you sketch out what the work is and you got to get paid for that. And you have to produce value for that and the value is in the implementation checklist. Next up, Hadaway asks, what is the best tool for monitoring always on replication progress? I don't care which third-party tool you use. There are a bunch of third-party monitoring tools you use. They, they all go back and forth into who's the best. You know, they do small leapfrogs back and forth. It's all six of one, half a dozen of the other. Uh, one will catch up, the other one will outpace the others. AGs aren't a new technology at this point. They've been out for like a decade, so it's not like you need cutting edge monitoring uh, for them. Just go pick a third-party tool. If you want to do implement implementation uh, decisions, um, Google for Brent Ozar, how to pick a SQL Server monitoring tool, and I have a blog post out there that explains to you how I would evaluate them. Uh, and then uh, one last question we'll do that's highly voted is uh, Eduardo asks, what are the keys to becoming a good public speaker? I would honestly just Google that. Uh, like I, I think that everybody's standards are different. Um, I would worry less about becoming a good speaker, I would worry more about your material. Uh, unless you're gonna become a professional trainer, tr pro professional trainer, I'm a professional trainer, I speak good. And I didn't mean the Southern accent in an insulting way, that's because I come from the South. And, uh, I don't have as much of an accent now because I've traveled around a lot. Uh, but uh, I would worry much less about having uh, a beautifully polished, presentation style and worry much more about delivering great content uh, that you're proud of. The people in our industry, as small as the database industry is, are very appreciative of good content. Uh, don't get me wrong, becoming a good speaker will help you as long as you live, but uh, I think it's much more important to nail down the contents of your presentation. All right, it is 7.46 in the morning. I believe our restaurant in here opens at uh, 8 a.m. So I'm gonna go take a little walk down the beach and uh, back before the restaurant opens, see if I can spot any baby sea turtles out there uh, that didn't